Okay, okay. So, uh, although the I registered to speak about Spectre, right? But I decided I myself since I'm speaking about Spectre, I shall speak about both of them because uh, some of the concepts, right? Is they are quite. So I just combine them. So what do you call it? Mm -hmm. Melter down. or spec down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I know some of you also, I think many of you did not come for last month one, so yeah, it's a good recap. Okay, so let's start. So these are the things I'm going to cover. I'll start with Meltdown first, then Spectre, then I'll have a short demo. I downloaded the example code for Spectre, la. Then, let's see, let's, and I tried it. Okay, so uh, let me start with Meltdown first. Okay, so this is the abstract given by in the paper, okay, so you say here, Meltdown exploits the side effects of out of order execution on modern processors, and I emphasize the points in bold to read arbitrary kernel memory locations. Okay, it can also be used to read memories of other processors. Okay, now let's look at Spectre's ab abstract. Okay, so Spectre's attacks involve uh, inducing a victim to speculatively perform operations that would not occur during correct program executions and leak the victim's confidential stuff. So the word kernel is not inside Spectre, right? Yeah, so Meltdown is on the, more to the kernel side. Okay, so this is the basic difference. Okay, so yeah, some concepts, right? So the terms out of order and speculative execution, what is the difference, okay? So this is, okay, this is the architecture of a modern Intel processor, Skylake one. So you can see they have many execution units here, right? So the goal of modern CPUs these days is to actually maximize the number of execution units that are being used at any one time. Okay, so how do they do it? So they, they bring this concept called the out of order execution. So in this paper, they make a distinction. So for out of order execution, this is how they define it. So any way of getting an operation executed before the processor is committed to the results of prior, or prior instructions. For speculative, execution is specifically refers to an instruction sequence following a branch okay yeah understand okay so th that is how the paper defines so okay okay, okay. So just to clarify on that so then speculative execution is one case of out of order execution no okay okay you can ex okay you guys okay no, I, but you can you can explain i'm <laughs> Okay, you go ahead. Okay. Try. No, no. So, um, I'm not sure. Out of order execution is a um, strategy. Is a strategy. Strategy. Used, yeah. Where yeah. You you have like yeah, let's say you're supposed to execute four instructions. You start running all four of them at the same time, or as soon as you can. And as they're executing, um, one may finish before the like the the, the, the one may be faster. It will take lesser time, and will finish before. The proper hierarchy of it, so it would actually be out of order in that way. So that would require the instructions not to be dependent. Exactly. So it it can deal with certain instructions which are not dependent on each other to be run uh, out of order, so to speak. And that's okay. out of order. Okay. But wouldn't speculative execution result in out of order? Yes. Typically, differently. So in their opinion, out of order is <laughs> when operations are executed before the professor uh, the professor has committed the results of all prior instructions. Whereas speculative speculative execution speculative execution is something that happens on purpose, where it specifically says, I don't know where this branch is gonna go, but I'm gonna start loading the next instructions anyway. Whereas out of order, out of order could be just a bunch of moves. Linear, right? In a linear form. Okay. So out of order could be just a bunch of moves that are supposed to happen one after each other, but it realizes actually I can do the third move faster than the second move is going to do it anyway. Okay. okay. I still think speculative execution will result in an out of order. It's a subset. Subset. Yes, it will, it will result in out of order, but not the way they define out of order. They define out of order specifically in that sense of here are four instructions I need to run together. I will run them in any order I want. But it doesn't say anything of the intention of the uh, instruction sequence. So, I'm, yeah, I think, order, I think probably later we'll yeah. cover, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the next one is the concept of address spaces. So, uh, 
in very old operating system, they probably is a one to one relationship between the there's they no such thing as virtual addresses. You, whatever you hit is the physical address. But of course, this is not the case for modern operating systems. So they, everything has its own virtual address space. And the thing is that currently, right, at least before this problem came out, right, uh, there's a mapping from user space to the physical memory. And the kernel space also has a mapping to physical memory. So basically, the user space can also have a mapping to the kernel memory. It's just that you might not be able to access it. This is actually for performance reasons. Huh? Okay, so the in this this uh, translation is stored in this uh, part of the processor it's called a translation look aside buffer here okay so uh, how does branch prediction lead to speculative execution in this case so uh, whenever you encounter a branch instruction like a if else right then what the processor will do is it will save a checkpoint then you try to predict and then you will try to execute the instructions so there are two possible outcomes so let's say the prediction is correct right then the processor just removes the checkpoint, then just continue. But let's say the prediction is wrong, right? The CPU is supposed to roll back, or rather it ignores everything, just reload everything back from the checkpoint at the point where the branch starts, okay? So you execute the... So let's say if it's wrong, you go back, then you execute the instructions. That's correct. Yes. yes, all right, yeah. Okay, so when did these two came out? So the branch prediction first came out in this uh, Pentium 1, 1993. The speculative execution is the next generation. So it's this one. They're quite quite old technologies already. Wait, wait, hang on. Yeah? So how, how do you have branch prediction without speculative? No, branch prediction is just to load the instructions but not to execute it. What's the point of loading it without execution? Oh. So, so that because if you have to load takes time, right? So they try to load it in advance, but they don't run it. Lah. Yeah. So it's, it's, the, it's the baby version of speculative yeah. execution. So this came first, then this. Yeah. Yes. Are they both vulnerable? Okay, so uh, Meltdown, I think Meltdown doesn't use the... Wait, uh, sorry. Uh, doesn't... Wait, I, I, I confused uh, both of them. One doesn't use... Spectre. Yeah, Spectre. Okay. okay, so the memory hierarchy. So, yeah, so you probably all know already L1, L2, L3. Okay, so they have used a concept called cache lines. Uh, so data chunks, they each size is... Each one is about 64 to 1 to 8 bytes. So, Yes, let me skip this. Uh, so now I come to the concept of the side channel attacks. Uh. Okay, so obviously you run multiple programs on the same CPU. So when one program changes the state of the CPU, right, it is possible for this change state to leak information to other programs. Okay, so with this uh, concept, we can have this strategy. Uh. So let's say we remove the line from the cache, then we test how long it takes to read. So let's say if the victim access the line recently, so the read is very fast. If not, the read is very slow. Yeah. yeah this, this is a very common strategy. Mm -hmm. They use it in many, 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 many attacks, including Rohammer. It's the same, same, same idea. Okay. Hang on. Uh, can you explain what's a cache line? Uh, what? Wow. Cache? Cache. A cache line. A cache line yes. is just one entry in the cache. Oh, okay. So they okay. call the line. Ah, 16. Okay. That's all. Okay. Um, so like, is that accessible to all programs? Or is that accessible? Um, cache, cache lines in the hardware. In the hardware. In the hardware. It is the interface so between your physical memory, right, to your actual needs of the instruction set register. And it's, and it's not specifically accessible to uh, the, 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 the any process. Uh, you And it's transparent to the process. So you can't actually see what's in cache. But what you can do is you can say, hey, I want to clear all cache and I want to read memory A. Uh, memory, uh, like, I want to watch the memory to location A, and I keep reading it. I keep re I, I keep reading it, and then I, I I clear the cache again, and I keep reading it again. So any program can clear, but isn't that cache space supposed to be dedicated, or is that is that sandbox? Uh, you can clear it to the, the uh, process. No, it's no. Not. but so any anybody can say empty the cache. Yes, uh, uh, yes, yes, can. There's a, actually an instruction. I'll come to that lah. They call CL flush to clear. Okay, so it's this one lah. Yeah, so, so, the, so they have this x86 instruction C of flush. Okay, so you just flush it away. Then there's uh, two ways to actually flush. One of them is of course use the instruction. The other way right is you can force the contention. That means you purposely go and activate this already. Then you just discard it. Yeah. So if you know how many lines you have. <laughs> it's just call, call, uh, call, call. So you say that you have 64 lines. You just 
specifically access 64 other uh, places so you know your cache is full and you have evicted the first thing out of the cache uh, and then you can go check how long it takes to, to retrieve the stuff and then know if that's been accessed by some other process. Okay. Test what to retrieve the stuff. Right, so the idea is you clear the cache and then you read, um, you read the memory again. So you read a specific, so you basically you, you read a specific memory that goes into cache and then you clear it. And you read the memory again. If that mem somebody else has already accessed that memory, that would be already in cache. Then that read will be very fast. So you have to like time it in a way. Yes. Right? Exactly. Okay. Okay. It's timing. timing later. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there's another concept called the transient instruction. Uh. Okay. So it, they define it specifically this way. So it's any sequence of instruction that when executed out of order, you leave measurable side effect. Okay. Okay, so this is the example they gave, the toy example. So, okay, so there's this, these two lines here, okay? So line 3 is speculatively executed before line 1's result is known. So by right, it's supposed to do this, finish, then you come here. But because of speculative execution, this is not true. So what happens when the execution is raised? So in theory, when the exception is raised here, the architecture effects will be discarded. But the problem is because of, uh, I just shorted the SE, right? Because of SE, right, this has already been done. And this has already been loaded. Wait, wait, will this be of order or speculative? Because speculative is there's a branch. Right? <laughs> it's speculative. 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 Yeah, there's no branch here. There's no branch. Wait, oh, eh? out of order is no branch. <laughs> I was also, <laughs> I was, I was, I was confused already. Really. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. It's a, it's a, it's a branch, right? It's a so, it's a branch. Yeah. So I'm not sure what the ex raise exception is. I don't know which 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 one is this, but uh, this exception could be a trap. Uh -huh. uh, which means it's uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it's considered as a speculative because you don't know if the trap's gonna. It's a branch. Ah, if else, okay, oh. yeah. okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what raise exception does. I need to read. I, I, I forgot. Okay, raise exception in this case can be any uh, because they access something fault, they're not supposed to access. Yeah, it could be a fault or a trap. Yeah. Uh, which I don't know what it's considered as. Later they explain because of they try to access kernel memory, then you get exception. The test there says due to our fault execution. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, they they also, yeah, also. <laughs> they, I actually I copy word for for the paper. They write that okay. Exception diverting a control flow to an exception handler that particular exception must not be explained. Do the out of order execution. Yeah, let me check. Let me check. This is this is classical out of order, right? Because it didn't predict the branch. It mm. just did, it just did it before the exception was raised. So why did it try to do it before? So it has to because, be speculated. Yeah. Uh, well, not really because it was just out of order, right? Here it didn't speculate. Okay, because in speculative execution, you, you, you know that there's a branch and you know that either I have to take the left ra road or the right road yeah. and I'm just going to take arbitrarily you can left see road. you can this as a branch. It no, an ex a, a trap is not a branch because a trap is a trap. And you always fall into the, the trap, right? The exception will happen. Yeah. Yeah. The exception will always happen. What do you mean that it will always happen? Oh, as in that. Oh, that raise exception oh. will always raise an exception. So there's no speculation here. You're not speculating whether you're going to take the left road or the right road. Mm. You're always going to take the left road. You know that beforehand. It's just you still agreed to do uh, to, to 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 run instructions from line three before the, the track finished executing. What it means by raise exception is like possible raise exception. Yeah, I don't think that's what they meant. Why not? In this example. This one is sure will raise, so I think. This is a toy example. Uh, troll new exception. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. Okay. Maybe here is wrong. This one. Okay. <laughs> nah, never mind. Okay. So after you do all this, right? Then you try to access the data you want, lah. So this is actually what in the paper they measured is very obvious, lah. The number of CPU cycles used to use if let's say the cache is already is the memory location is in the cache. Oh. Yeah. So much difference. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so how how will the program actually access this information? Uh, as in, uh, yeah, because they have a bunch of array right address, so you do not know which one is the you want to access the that the critical information. So you access everything. Correct, but it's like how uh the the program will actually the hacker will actually need to save this called so called information somewhere right, so that you can analyze it or or. 
Okay, in this one for Meltdown, right, they, they first, they have the, they need to find where the kernel memory address is. Yeah, so once you find that, right, you know the kernel is in this range. So you start to probe. You hit uh, all the kernel addresses. Okay, is that, I think this range is correct, Physical right? address or virtual? Physical. Physical, physical Okay, okay. Uh, Yeah, yeah. And then when it's long? When it's long, that means it's, uh, it's not been loaded. Yes, it's not been used previously. But then which hasn't been used So it's like one index as, it, as long or... Uh, sorry, when it is very long, that means it's not been accessed recently by the so, kernel. So yeah. let's, say, let's say the, the probe array, right? In that probe array, there's a bunch of addresses. By right, you should have never touched that for a long time, right? So every uh, like all those addresses, you you should be able to uh, you would take a long time. None of that should be in cache, mm -hmm. but uh, because it exists out of order, now that's in cache. So access to anything in the probe array would be much faster than if line three had not been executed out of order. So this is this is attackers program or. So this is for him to test that whether there is um, out of order execution. Okay. Okay. So the building blocks. So, so now the exception thing comes in, right? So this is where an exception will happen when you try to access something you're not supposed to. So the kernel will actually cause your process to have an exception, right? So now there are several ways you can do. Uh, so there's one way to uh, handle the exception. Because your program just crashed and then you can't do much. So what they do is that they fork out the attack program. So the attack program will just uh, call access the invalid location. Then if it tries to access the kernel memory location, right, it will crash, right? But the thing is, because of the trying to run this, uh, access this kernel memory, it has already been loaded to cache. And so the parent process, right, can actually recover the data from the cache. But the problem with this is there's high overhead. Every time you have exception, then it's like you lose a lot of CPU time. So there's another way, which is actually this instruction. So this is actually a quite a new instruction called transactional synchronization extension, the TSX. So it just basically suppresses the exception. <laughs> so, so the idea is the, the program tries to access kernel memory, okay. which causes, a f and then immediately after that tries to access, uh, uh, no, ac uh, it tries to access kernel memory and immediately, uh, no, yeah, uh, yeah, tries to access kernel memory, which caused an exception, exception, but the kernel memory has already Ready been loaded to cache. And been loaded to cache. Okay. Because out of order. Yeah. Right? So if I try if I'm a if I'm a userland program, I have no access to kernel memory, I try to access kernel memory, it will raise an exception. But it will also go forward and actually access the kernel memory. Right? And then throw it away. So By it right throw it away from the registers, but it will still be in cache. So then I can go back into cache and try to uh, try to read it out. Okay. So things that you that you need like two processors. For this first one, you need two processors. Two processors. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you fork yourself. The user land hackers program handles the exception also. Yes. 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 Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yes. Parent process. The parent oh, so process. You, you fork. Okay. And if your child accept uh, throws an exception, you you get, you get control. That. The, the child just died. Then there you get. Out. Yeah, correct. So it's quite uh, a yeah, for tedious programming. And that's yeah. why I said high overhead. Right? Right, right. But then they have this way yeah. where you say if you uh, if you execute this TSX instruction, there won't be an exception. Yeah, there is June 2013. I don't know why there's such an instruction also. Uh. <laughs> okay, oh, so let's go to you here. Okay, so now this is uh, how the meltdown is actually done, right? So. We first like we want let's say we want to know what's inside this uh this kernel address, RCX. Okay? So we try to move. Okay? But the moment you try to do this step right, supposedly the exception will be thrown, right? And you're not supposed to execute uh, lines five onwards. But then because of the the speculative execution, it goes it continues. Oh sorry, out of order. Mix up. Okay. Okay, okay. Because of two papers, I copy also. This is out of order. Okay. Out, okay. Out of order. Okay. So, uh, it continues to line five. Okay. So now this is a very interesting thing they did, right? Because they want to access a single byte. Yeah. 
But the, so uh, if they just want to read it like that, right, you actually will load a lot of other stuff in. So what they do is they, they convert this single byte to an entire uh, cache line. Is, is, it, is it a cache line already? Multiple. Multiple, multiple cache line. So, yeah, so it loads the entire thing up. So it makes sure that when CPU loads only that thing, okay? Then after that, uh, you have this sound of secret, secret access. Uh, okay? Then after that, you flush. Okay? Flush reload to determine the access cache line. Then with these steps, right, you actually can dump everything already. Okay. Okay, let me continue. So, uh, okay, because of time limitation, I will not go through these uh, steps in the paper. Lah. Yeah, so you can read more about this. So these are affected CPUs. Actually, not just Intel CPUs, uh, these two also. Not so well known. Okay, so why, why is majority of ARM and AMD not affected? This explanation is actually not inside the paper because they were rushing it. So the, actually the answer is because Intel, right, they don't check these underprivileged TLV hits. While the ARM and AMD, right, they will actually will stop this. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you find underprivileged? No, you access when you are user process, you're not supposed to have access to the kernel memory address. Okay. When, she, when only actually, you see the load executes, but you will not actually, uh, I think you will not actually load it into the cache. Uh, if I remember right. No, it, yeah, it, it, probably won't, it, it probably won't do the translation for mm. you. It probably mm. it, uh, uh, return a, a, a garbage address. Oh. Or, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So okay, so uh, okay, maybe you can disable, then okay, your CPU performance will just drop. Uh. So the, this paper actually proposed that you, you should have a new register uh, to split the memory address space. So uh, no performance cost, but then it actually costs money. You have to change the whole CPU just for that. Then, okay, this is the common one, the software patch. Uh. So this software patch, Kaiser, right? It's actually the original, it really came from this paper. KS, this kernel address space lay, uh, layout randomization. So it's dead, long live this, in June 2017. So they actually came out with this concept. Uh, so they say you don't map the kernel memory to the user space anymore. But the thing is, in order to keep doing that, you need to flush the, this, this translation buffer. Yeah. Yeah, but it's every single call, you, you throw you need Throw the whole oh, thing, Re oh, <coughs> reload the whole thing. There are some utility programs called this uh, function system called, called MMAP. Yeah. Ah, so no, this no. is MMAP. No, no, no. Ah, no, for... no longer, no longer so map. It's no longer, map, so yeah. you have to do it the old syscall way of asking byte by byte. No, but this one is even worse, right? You're basically saying flush the TLBs whenever you make syscalls. Any syscall, you flush TLB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> cost, uh, performance cost lah. <laughs> <laughs> so here, let's see, the paper says this, but in practice, they measure is 5, 5 to 30%. Oh no, audio device drivers also. Yeah, yeah. Anything, right? Anything is this called. No, I mean, use this call a lot, yeah. Um, the, the kernel memory no longer map to user space. Uh. So, I know a couple of things that use this, like this video and audio yeah. device drivers. Uh -huh. And the user land side. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so that's the Spectre one. So the Spectre actually got two types. Uh. Yeah. Okay, so the difference, yeah, so Meltdown does not use branch prediction. So Spectre does. Then Spectre does not use the, this privilege execution, uh, escalation vulnerability. Okay. So because of this, it's not meant for kernel stuff. Uh. So the, the KPTI patch does not work for this. So the idea is you leak other uh, memory of other processors. Okay, so the concepts. So they, they have three, uh, ways, uh, sorry, the three steps they do it. So they mistrain the CPU. So it, it makes the branch predictor think that, okay, you want the next step you want to take is this, 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 this. Then suddenly you do something different. Uh, and then the branch, predi branch predictor will continue to execute that, right? Yeah, until the, until the, it realizes too late that you're not supposed to go to that, that branch. Then after that, you just recover the, this uh, sensitive data. Okay, so this is the, for variant number one. Uh, so here, right, uh, you, you are supposed to be checking whether the X is, X must be within smaller than this array size, right? Then you go in to the branch, okay? So by right, you're supposed to do the check that you go in, okay? Okay, so, uh, so we don't read outside of array while it's not exception triggered, okay? Uh, 
But however, this is not the case. So uh, during the speculative execution, right, they can actually go inside. Because if you keep training the branch predictor to think that this will always be true. So even when one day is actually, well, one time is actually false, but the branch, pre branch predictor will think that it's still true. Then it's, it really goes in. So depending on the value of x you use, right, it, might, it will actually try to load out what is the memory or the value of the memory address. Yeah. So and then you catch it. Okay, so the other way is uh, the poisoning indirect branches. Uh. So this is a variant too. Uh. So, uh, so it's possible for this instruction to jump to more than two because you have a branch, right? So it can jump to two, two sets. So this is the x86 code for that. So this is how they do. Uh. So you train the branch predictor with all this malicious destination. Then after that, you really go and execute. It goes to that uh, this uh, area that you want to execute and you execute it. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so there are actually five variants. Uh. Okay? So here, if the, let's say the register R1 has a secret value, okay? So if it's a hit, then nothing will go in and then R2 will be read, will be read very quickly. Uh. So if let's say the R1 is a cache miss, then the second one will take longer. So you can roughly, you can get based on the timing. You know whether it has been read before or not. That's similar to... Uh, Sorry? This is similar to Melgun. It's the same way that it uses the side channel. Yes, yeah, similar. Oh, but here you're not using caches, you're using registers. So mm. the idea is you have swapped Sorry. processes recently and then you are trying to read the leftovers from the previous mm. process which is in r1 mm. but if you tr when you try to read it properly it should give you zero or mm. some garbage value but it actually gives you the real value because you do execute it mm. spec uh, yeah. out of and uh, uh, speculatively another thing is that it may be on the same process because one process can be doing multiple things right yeah so sometimes it's a secret part sure. also okay also. also <laughs> Because maybe for example like the web browsers, maybe some of them run everything in a single process, right? Then you may not want some another part of the another thread for example to access another one. Yeah. Okay, so instruction timing. So they also can use multiply. Instead of trying to load, right? They can also time by multiplying it or dividing or whatever. Then you based on the timing on the multiply, you can actually leak what is R1 and R2. Okay, so what's number three? So uh you can actually, there's actually a finite number of uh, registers used to store the checkpoints. So you can detect, right, whether this checkpoint, uh, I think it exists, right, you can actually uh, review the information on R1. Wow, actually, wow, okay, what is this now? <laughs> okay, I mean, right, inside the paper, right, all these are words, right? so I just, <laughs> okay, so what is this? If you have, uh, without conditional branches, you determine, mistrain it, yeah, it's a note for myself. Uh, that, uh, like <laughs> well, even without conditional branches. Hmm. Well, how do you do that? Did the mid one. So, I only finished the slides last night, yeah, so. <laughs> so this one, I, 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 I was not sure. Is it jump considered a conditional branch? Uh, uh, yes. No. If it is yeah. a, like a jump not for equal or whatever. Then it's, it's considered a conditional branch. That's a conditional jump. But if uh, a pure jump, like a jump, uh, then no, I guess. So probably. When the rifle returns. We always jump. I'm not sure. So there's nothing to. Okay, but in ARM, everything is conditional. Oh. Including the jump. Oh, because you can add the. Yeah, add the, the test bits. Right? Test bits and the flags and whatnot, and then. <laughs> so maybe it's more. Okay, yeah. I think I let me skip this. Okay, what was this now? <laughs> Leveraging when it's observable when it's in this case. Yeah, yeah. So using the same idea as the uh, first one. Okay, never mind, let's keep. Okay, so how do we try to stop this? Maybe we can try to halt the speculative execution, right? So one way they, they mentioned in the paper is that you can try to use something called serializing instructions. Okay, however, this is different from uh, ensuring that speculative execution does not occur. So they say, yeah, it might not work. Lah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, okay. stuff like loop unrolling would help, right? Because technically, instead of, so loop, the way loop unrolling works, instead of having a loop where you do something, do something, check a counter, and then 
uh, sort of jump back, which is how normally we do with loops. Mm. Uh, uh, loop unloading would literally, if your loop is 10 times, it will just right, copy paste the instructions 10 times. <laughs> Oh, okay. right. oh. So, so in, in those kind of things, it will help because it's, you don't have any branches anymore, right? Software <laughs> bloat. <laughs> uh. So what they say? Oh, yeah, they add delays. Yeah, but then they say because the this speculative execution can go on for so long, right? Then you need to delay for. Look at this. The routine says so nearly two hundred instructions ahead uh, of the cache. So you need to delay that that amount. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. So it, they can wait. They can insert this uh, speculative execution blocking instructions. However, it's like if you do this too much, right? Then it's very bad for performance. So they say that it's possible if you, to do static analysis to find out where is the best place to put it. Uh. But the problem is, even if you can, you need to recompile all your code, which is very troublesome if you have to recompile everything. Yeah. So how? Let's say you have to mitigate indirect branch poisoning, right? So, you can flush, try to flush before it switches, but there's no, they say there's no way to do it currently. Okay, uh, micro code fixes. Yeah, significant performance penalty. Then, possible to actually buffer this uh, speculative uh, initiated instructions separate from the cache. Yeah. Well, but then they say that you can test other stuff already. Cache is actually not the only thing you can test for. All these side channels. Okay, so uh, it's supposed to be the demo, right? Yeah. That's what we're here for. <laughs> okay, uh, then come first, right? So this uh, this is the the simple check, uh. So you can see, right? Okay, my system is using a very old kernel. I deliberately did not update the kernel for this. <laughs> so you can see it's vulnerable to everything. Uh, yeah, where yeah. Okay, yeah. Spectre variant one, variant two, variant three, all vulnerable. Okay. <laughs> By vulnerable means what? At least one attack had been successful. Uh, because it has both, uh, it has a, okay, for example, like this variant for meltdown, right? Yeah. So it doesn't have this uh, isolation for the kernel and user memory so the, so because the of the kernel version. The test program can read. So this test program actually okay. is executing and attacking. Okay, no, no, okay, for this one, so no, this one doesn't. This one just tests whether your kernel has this feature and you this oh, one. Yeah, there? this checks if the, yeah, whether the kernel and the CPU has the... Oh, so it's probably really running an ah. attack right now. Like. Yeah, no, no, okay, yeah. Okay. Then for this one, okay. Uh, okay, uh, the code is quite complex, so I can't really say I can explain it well, but yes, apparently there's some secret data here. And remember, recall this very familiar function, victim right. function here. So this program will try to access this uh, without directly trying to read what's inside this secret, secret 2 array. Okay, I see I'm running just now already. Okay, so the what was the text again, right? Let me go. Let me go back to the text. So is this is some sam sample sensitive data? This others, this is some other sample sensitive data. Okay, so they actually can read it out. Okay. you can see the word. This is some other. Yeah. yeah. Although it's on the same process, right, But this is just to show the concept. Okay, so let's go to the code, right? Wait, nah. So the program is such that uh, in normal execution, the secret will not leak. Yeah, it shouldn't leak. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so let's start with the victim function here. So the victim function here, right? In order to get inside here, but right, your value of x must be less than the array one size. So array one size is sixteen. So only can zero to fifteen. But right. Okay, so the next one is the read memory byte. So the main function will actually call this. So what they will do is that they will first make a lot of uh, training calls to this. They will, they will train the branch predictor with correct values of x. So less than? Less than 16. Yeah. Okay, so the, the CPU branch predictor will think that, okay, I will, it seems like all the values that go inside this function is correct. Uh. Okay, so after that, they will suddenly change it. Yeah, really suddenly they change to something else. And then because of the this speculative execution, right, then it will the branch predictor still thinks this value of x is still correct. And it really go and try to go and fetch the memory. 
Yeah. And that memory will be out of the array. Out of the array. Because it's bigger than the size of the array. Yes, it's bigger. And, and this, this will be something else already. And then you hopefully in this case it will be... This. It will yeah. be beyond that so it will get to the next... Yes, one, because the yeah. I think in C probably all these when they are allocated, right, all side by side to each other. Yeah, side by side. Okay. Then there's a uh, instruction they use, they call the flush probe. Where did they is it, use it? Uh? I can't yeah, find it. Yeah, yeah, here. Okay, so this is. Yeah, well, let me go back to my slides. So this is uh, the modern PC. Okay, so what about the old PC here? So this. This is I deliberately chose this PC because this is actually no speculative execution. Okay. Okay, this is what okay, so let me sorry yeah. Can you see? Oh can. Okay. Okay, let me run it again because it blocks. Okay, so you can see this is an i5 A6 CPU, Phantom one. <laughs> yeah, it has a uh, branch prediction, uh, but no speculative execution. Okay, let me. Okay, so let's run. Let's try to run this. Use a uh, checker first. Okay, uh, Ken, it's very very slow. Uh, okay, you is you can't really hear. Yeah, it's a buffer. Wow, can you see? Anyway, uh, the kernel version is known. It's a CPU is mobile Pentium MMX. So you can see, right? One, two, three. No, no, no. <laughs> no, Spectre and Valve check. Both. Yeah, both also cannot. Yeah, yeah. It's very easy. You just run all your Facebook, whatever. <laughs> And uh, the Debian version here, yeah, I don't know if it's visible or not, is actually Debian uh, Jesse. It's actually an outdated version of Debian. Now it's Debian Stretch. Yeah, because the latest Debian Stretch, right, they require 686 CPU. Oh, Pentium 2. Yeah. So I took get the older version. Okay, so this part is very, very slow. Okay, so uh, just let me pause, let me run in the background first. Okay, so. Uh, I wouldn't be able to run the the actual attack level because CL flush right, is a very new instruction. Oh. There, it's in SSE two in Pentium four, two thousand and one, so I cannot run that. Okay, so you can see the conclusion. So there are many software isolation techniques. However, this they all assume that CPU will do it properly. Yeah, but speculative execution violates this assumption. Yeah. So because of that, they make the, the final conclusion. There is actually a trade-off between security and performance. So right now, there's uh, patches for Meltdown. Yes. Not yet for Spectre. Spectre, there are some microcode updates, I believe. Uh, okay. But it's not 100%. Uh. Meltdown, is they use the KPTI patch, uh, they just isolate the user and kernel memory. Oh, this is really very slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Can you show the, Sorry. the attacker code? Okay, can you find this code on GitHub? Yeah, yeah, I took it from GitHub. From GitHub. <laughs> yeah. What are you planning to do? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually uh, close to the official code that in the, uh, came out with the paper. All right. Yeah. Can you show? Uh, Which one you see? Okay. okay. So it goes to Sorry. Five training runs. Okay. Ah, oh, I tell me it's, a, it's a, a lot of code there. Okay. So it's doing that. Uh, if you scroll, if you scroll up a little bit. It's doing the that R R R T D S C P. So yeah, timer. Time how long it takes. So it's basically using an internal CPU timer, super high resolution, mm, to see yeah. how long the access to the address takes. See, junk equals star uh, address, right? Yeah. Now. That's just the access to the memory. So you basically read the timer, access to the memory, and read the timer again. Uh, and this timer, this timer is super high high resolution, so it can detect whether this this um, read took like a few microseconds mm. or 
or a few mm. nanoseconds, nanoseconds. Microseconds. And if it's nanoseconds, it means it's in cache. If it's nano microseconds, it's, it's from in memory. I wonder what's the cache heat threshold. Let's see. Uh, cache heat threshold is how much? Did they, where did they put this? Oh, 80. Uh. Here. 80, I think it's nanoseconds. Uh, what, what is this RTDSP, right? Uh, what is it supposed to give you? Uh, it's a counter, so it should give you in counts. In, in, I don't think it's a, it's a pot counter. Pot counter. Pot counter. Pot counter. Why they use it? Yeah, why they use 80 so hard coded? It might be different for. I think it's 80 times the other one or something like that. That's uh. Wait, 80 times? Yeah, every time cell counter. Okay. That's the part where they read the read the memory to try to get a leak uh, information. Okay. Uh, where? Are? Good Sorry, question. Is it Sorry, where? Are? Do you know where is it? Is this instruction available for ARM? Oh yeah. I don't know. I'm not uh, sure where is it. Time reads. One of the A thirty five, I think, one of the higher ones. Results. But our lower ones, earlier ones don't have. I'm not very sure there. Different or different words. Scroll, scroll down. I like to. No more here. Yeah. I'm asking him the. Where, where did they? From the. So what they do is, you see the if time two is less than equals to cache ah. threshold, blah 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 blah, right? Ah. So basically, it tries to see if it was it was a cache hit or a cache yeah. miss. And based on whether it was a hit or a miss, it guesses. It uses that to guess whether what was in the memory. Because it, because if you see if you, if you scroll the victim function, right, there's one level of indirection in the array thing, right? So it's 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 reading an array of an array. So it by if you go to the victim function, okay, yeah. it up, see it's an array of an array. Okay. Right. right? So the, the set, array one x of array two. So what it does is basically tries to find, uh, tries to see if uh, what something is in cache or not, and if it's in cache, then it uses that to dis to make a decision what was in uh, what was in the array because it whatever was in the cache was loaded as a single level indirection. So it's using using one of the arrays as a pointer to the uh, as as a pointer inside ah. the other array, okay. and then it sees if the pointer was uh, the pointer was in cache. If it was in cache, that means it guesses what was there in the array. Okay. So it's a, it's a, this is a very common thing that they do in cache timing attacks. Okay, so this so slide is done. Because, Sorry. Uh, this, the attacker code actually print out the this is yeah. the, so actually it's printing out from where? Where's the line that prints out? So I, I just want to see. I think it should be in score. Score, okay. Score value results, the, that, that bit. Mm. Somewhere right. here is it. Success. Value, is it? Yeah. It's, it's value, value zero, right? Print value here. If it's gone, green second, they have a second best also. Sure. Oh. Yeah. So it it, uh, it 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 needs to do a little bit of statistical analysis there. And the uh, can you go back to the declaration for read memory byte? Yeah. Oh, okay. Here. D is read. Read. Value value value. Let's go let's go a bit down. I just want to see where the value variable is being used. Ah, okay. Oh, sorry. Just say it starts. It's in value, right? Yeah, yeah. And score is its its confidence <laughs> level of how it is, how good it is. J. Mm. Oh, yeah. <sighs> okay. Okay. I just want to come to this line. Yeah. So, even though the, all the the OS is quite old. Everything is not vulnerable. Yes, <laughs> so you have to use an OPC. <laughs> Something else that's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, that, yeah, that's already lah. Yeah, I, don't, I think all your questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the line can stop. Sorry. Yeah, stop. stop.